Thank you, Joanne. Um, uh, so let me uh, talk about uh, what I do, and I do about three different things. Uh, I am a church consultant with a company called Tag Consulting. So I work with churches all across the United States, all kinds of denominations, all sizes, uh, from worshiping 30 to worshiping 20,000. And we do consulting and uh, strategic planning and visioning and conflict resolution and stuff like that. So that's what I do uh, to uh, feed myself and my family. Uh, but what uh, I'm really, in many ways, also called to is the work of uh, international peace activism. And I connected with an organization called Christian Peacemaker Teams, which was founded 26 years ago out of the Mennonite Church. When my wife and I were looking to be peace activists, we thought, who does it better than Mennonites, right? <laughs> and so we wanted to learn from them. And so for the last five years, we've been connected with their work. Uh, they, uh, Christian Peacemaker Teams, we only go where we're invited by local partners on the ground. Uh, and these would be partners who share uh, Christian Peacemaker Team's radical nonviolent values. Uh, so 19 years ago, we were invited by the mayor of Hebron to uh, come and work in Hebron because school children were being attacked every day as they were going to and from school uh, by the settlers in Hebron. And so I go back to Hebron on a regular basis as a CPT reservist. There are different ways you can connect to CPT. You can be a full-timer, you can be a part-timer, or you can be a, a reservist. And the only difference about being a reservist is that you get to pay for the privilege of going and serving over there as opposed to being paid. So, um, so I've been very, very blessed to be a part of this uh, organization. And I want to just tell you a little bit about the work in general that we do there and I arrived, we just uh, found out, uh, I arrived two days before Ed left uh, and uh, was there through the end of June and all of July. Uh, that's when things were getting very busy in the West Bank. Uh, they were doing all the things and more uh, that I'll tell you a little bit about. Um, this is Hebron, the old city of Hebron. Uh, Ed shared that you've got uh, different areas, and in the city of Hebron, they have H1 and H2. And the dark part there on the uh, video or on the uh, slide is H2. It is uh, controlled by the Israeli military. Supposedly, H1 is controlled by the Palestinian Authority. Although when I was there, that was not true in June and July. And right now, uh, they have, uh, the military has gone into H1 and is pretty much controlling it. So uh, just to give you a sense of the size of that, uh, from uh, the left part, that part on, that's sticking out there, all the way to where you get to the pink, which is a settlement called Kiryat Arba, uh, is about a mile, maybe a mile and a tenth and so you got about another mile going up and down, but it's not a square. So this is less than two square miles. And what we have there are four settlements right in the city and a big settlement, that pink one on the edge, all within this very dense area within the old city of Jerusalem. And in the middle of, or I mean uh, Hebron, and in the, in the midst of that is a mosque slash synagogue where Abraham and Sarah are buried. A little bit of a contentious location since both Muslims and Jews find that to be very holy ground and they fight over it. CPT is the only international organization that lives right in the middle of H2. We live right next door to one of the, the settlements. So, uh, and we've been doing that for 19 years. We generally, during the school year, uh, monitor school, uh, you know, school children going to and from school, people going through checkpoints, things like that. We also, one of our mottos is getting in the way of violence. And so we literally, when there is violence, we run to it. Uh, and yes, we have very extensive training. And we literally try to get in the middle of it if we can to diffuse it if that's a possibility. So this year, um, what you, well, this is, this is a good description of H2. The, uh, 
Jewish name for this city is Hebron. The uh, Arabic name is Al-Khalil. And there are closed streets, so there are streets that Palestinians are not allowed to use, period, or even cross. So where people, you know, a number of years ago could walk across the street to get from their house to their business, now they have to walk usually about a mile and go through two or three checkpoints to get to work and to get home and so on, and they're often stopped. Um, you have closed shops. Uh, uh, the major street in Hebron uh, was closed to Palestinians and 300 shops, Palestinian shops, were welded shut. The people who lived, you have a shop and you live above the shop. People who lived above the shops now had no access to their homes except with ladders that go up on the roof to the roof access to go back down. Um, they have restricted movements. They have unlawful detentions. Uh, Ed shared a little bit about that. They uh, skyrocketed this summer with uh, after the yeshiva students uh, were kidnapped. Uh, it was an excuse for uh, Brothers Keeper to be implemented. This was a long-held plan of the Israeli government. And so uh, they were arresting people with no charges, which uh, they call administrative detention. Uh, in Israel, they can arrest non-Israeli citizens, of course. Couldn't do this to Israeli citizens, but you can arrest non-Israeli citizens without charge and hold them indefinitely, years. Uh, and so that's obviously a big problem. You have settler attacks on Palestinians, including children. So with these four settlements, and I'm not talking about the big one on the, on the side, there are probably about 700 settlers and there is also a military base right in the middle of where these settlements are, right next to our apartment where we live, that has about 800 soldiers. So you have about a one-to-one -one ratio soldier to settler uh, there. And the Palestinians attack, I mean, the Palestinians are attacked by settlers and the um, Israeli military pretty much cannot touch a settler. You cannot, they, they cannot touch a settler because they would be in big, big trouble. So while settlers attack, the military watches. It's a surreal thing. And they also ta attack international activists because, of course, they don't like us documenting what they're doing. So, uh, so we are attacked as well. Uh, so many checkpoints, I can't even tell you uh, how many they are. there are. Home invasions. So over the last 20 years, they will just at 3 in the morning do a home invasion, and they will usually put everybody in one room, and then they will stay in the house and dump out dresser drawers and, you know, just kind of make a mess, and then they leave. And you can expect that to happen to your home every now and then, you know, a couple times a year or whatever. And, you know, they're used to it now. They clean up, they put it all back together, and they go, okay, well, that won't happen for a while until this summer. And what happened this summer was not only did they do those things, but then they took crowbars and, and sledgehammers and, uh, you know, ruined appliances and put holes in walls and tore out electrical panels and um, in a, a town right outside of Hebron called Haska, which is where they found the suspect's car, um, they poisoned all of the cisterns where these people get their drinking water. Uh, and they would come in and they would do it one night and people would clean up as best they could and then they came back the next night. And they would clean up and then we had one captain tell a family stop cleaning up we're coming back every single night until you tell us where the suspects are hiding and of course these families had no no connection to any of this violence uh, so and at the same time that was happening if you lived in Hebron but you and you had a permit to work in Jerusalem which many do all summer, you could not cross the border. So now these people have no income as well. 
So we have home invasions, home demolitions. They would just demolish homes. Uh, they demolish the homes of the suspects. You have to remember, though, that homes in Palestine aren't like, uh, you know, it's my wife and me, and when my kids were young, my two kids. Well, you have three, and sometimes three generations up and down, and then aunts and uncles. You can have basically five different families all re closely related, living in one home. And if one person is a suspect, just a suspect, they demolish the whole home. And now you have all these families that are now homeless. Okay? Now, interestingly enough, you know that part of this summer there was a Palestinian killed in Jerusalem. They have suspects, Israeli suspects. Did they demolish those family homes? Of course not. So it, it is really a, a different standard. The other thing I want to tell you about uh, is that over all the years I've been there, um, there are a lot of demonstrations in Hebron and all throughout the West Bank. And uh, usually uh, it, you can kind of count on a peaceful protest until some of the young men who are so frustrated at you know, the occupation begin to throw stones. And normally what happens is, and I've seen this, been a part of you know, the crowd, tear gas and sound grenades and rubber bullets to disperse the crowd. And by the way, that worked pretty well, as you can imagine. This year, they started using live ammunition, uh, aiming for the legs, but of course, not always hitting the legs. And so our neighbor this summer, uh, 47 years old, you know, married, kids, the whole bit, grandkids, was shot in the chest and killed um, in, as he was crossing the street. So uh, it is right now, the, they have just taken everything to a very scary new level. Um, so as Ed was saying, he's saying, you know, he doesn't want to be seen watching, you know, somebody from the third floor. CBT um, actually gets as close as I am to you, to the soldiers as they're doing what they're doing. So we're, we're a little bit crazy uh, and weird. Um, so um, I took this picture um, from here to where Ed is uh, of uh, them firing on a crowd uh, in Hebron. Here is a picture of a home demolition that happened. This home demolition happened two days before I took the picture. Uh, and uh, very common uh, events here because in the West Bank, except for a few areas, which I'm so exciting to hear Ed tell us about uh, this, you know, uh, complex that they're building, uh, generally Palestinians cannot get permits to build. And uh, so they build anyway because they have a growing family and then their homes are demolished. This is just a picture of what I picked up on the street one night as I was coming from a demonstration. Uh, so that is a uh, sound grenade in the back. Uh, and by the way, those are very loud. Um, I was standing outside a checkpoint because they had arrested some people and we always go to find out what's going on. And there was a large crowd, probably about 30 or 40 uh, Palestinians, very upset about this particular arrest and they didn't like it. So all of a sudden I see flying uh, across um, a sound grenade that lands right on my foot and you, you run when you see that happening. Well, I got about six feet away, so, <laughs> you know, it's very, very loud. Um, and those are live bullets, by the way, uh, casings. Uh, and that's new now, they're using live bullets. Um, settler attacks, those are settlers in the back that are, are being protected by the soldiers. And uh, they have what's called in Hebron settler tours that they go right in the middle of the open market in Hebron while shops are open and bring settlers through to disrupt the, really the only purpose is to disrupt what's going on in the Palestinians' lives. Uh, I'm trying to uh, live amid the violence. Uh, I want to tell you a quick story. So what happens, uh, there, were, there were huge demonstrations on a daily basis in Hebron this summer, which is highly unusual, but with everything going on, the Palestinians wanted to show their displeasure, of course. And uh, what usually ends up happening is that it starts out peaceful, then it gets to be you know, rock throwing by the, what the, the Arabic word is the Shabab, 
the Shabab are the young males, you know, like, you know, 16 to 20 years old. And they're throwing rocks and so on. And what happens is then they, they shoot and tear gas and sound bombs and it goes back and forth. It's this violent dance that they play. And then there's usually a lull. And it's so common there, this kind of activity, is that men, women, and children wait kind of along the side of this, this demonst the violent demonstration until there's a lull so they can cross the street to get to home or to their business or to buy milk or whatever it is. It's a, and that's what this gentleman is doing. Uh, there's a lull and he's just crossing the street and you can see there's a lot of debris and stuff in the street. Uh, so one night I'm watching this happen and uh, again, there's some soldiers right over here, and, and uh, another cpt -er and I are here, and we're watching this happen. We were recording it, making video, and three little boys um, are waiting to cross. Uh, maybe nine, seven, and about four, and they're all holding hands. And there's a lull, and they start to cross, and just as they start to cross, um, they start firing rubber bullets and, and uh, sound bombs. And so the three come running back. And the little four-year-old, you know, was just shaking. And he came and he ran right to us because there, we are known in Hebron. We wear red hats. I have one over here on the table. So, and we wear um, vests that everybody knows, CPT is there. And uh, they came running, and the little four-year-old just grabbed my leg and wouldn't let go, you know. And it reminded me that, you know, I can't change the situation there. But one of the things we do as uh, CPTers there is we're on the ground in the moment, and I was there for that little boy as he was shaking, and then we were able to find a different way around the demonstration to get them where they needed to go, which was home. They were trying to get home. And uh, so we might not be able to change the situation, but we might be able to just be that, you know, little bit of, of love and grace and, and uh, acceptance within a violent, very violent situation. Um, here's a little girl. This is a very common occurrence. You see the little girl, you see the soldiers, the, the guy in the red has another CPT or back there, and some Palestinians. This is normal life. These children have guns pointed at them every single day. They hear gunfire. They know the smell of tear gas. It is a horrible way to imagine growing up, and yet these kids don't imagine it. It's what they do. It is absolutely heartbreaking. All they know is violence and restrictions. So it's just a horrible, horrible time. So the question is, what about the future? And maybe we'll get some more questions on this, but I'll give you a little general. So people ask me, so what, is there any hope? And I would say right now, no. That's where I am right now. Uh, that in the near future, I don't think we're gonna see any major changes. I don't have a lot of hope uh, anything coming out of the violence in Gaza that's going to be positive. Um, I'm beginning more and more to believe hope lies in uh, the civil community, uh, not in our political leaders here in the United States, in the Arab countries, in Israel, or in Palestine. Uh, they've been trying to you know, figure this out for decades, and they haven't done it. But more and more through the BDS movement and through other civil or you know, society organizations, uh, we are waking up to we need to start putting pressure on our governments to see that we need to actually have a radical change. And my study of nonviolent activity and cha transformational change, whether it's a civil rights movement in the United States, whether it is South Africa, Yugoslavia, India, we can actually start naming these. These are places where absolute transformational change happened because it was the people, both you know the, the regular people plus the international community supporting them, rising up and saying, no more. And I'm, uh, that's where my hope is. And that's why I am so glad you are all here because it's people like you that can begin to make a difference 
um, you don't have to go you know, to the West Bank to make a difference. You can speak out, you can talk to your politicians, you can uh, get involved in the BDS movement. There are lots of different things. And finally, I'm gonna put a plug in for CPT. <laughs> um, we are in Palestine, we're in Iraq, we're in Colombia, we're in Greece, Canada, believe it or not, with First Nations rights, um, and on the US-Mexican border. And if you're interested in finding more out, I've got brochures back here. We also do delegations, and specifically uh, to all those places, by the way, but to Palestine. Um, if you've been on what I call the Disneyland tour of Israel, uh, which is the, you know, we go to see all the sites and stuff, I encourage you to do that because the sites are just awesome and they're part of our history and stuff. But if you want an alternative, uh, you know, kind of look at Palestine and Israel, CPT does 10-day delegations and you get into the West Bank, you get into Hebron, you get into East Jerusalem, you uh, learn and you meet all of our partner organizations, both Israeli and Palestinian, that CPT works with, and you hear from the Palestinians. It is a wonderful thing, and there's brochures about that as well.